these are my disclosures. So Pitfall is considered one of the greatest video games of all time. It was released for the Atari 2600 uh, during my childhood back in 1982. and involves uh, Pitfall Harry, that's the character, trying to get through the jungle in 20 minutes, much like this lecture, and picking up treasures, which we'll call pearls to take home, along his way. He has to maneuver around snakes, uh, scorpions, crocodiles, and as the name of the game suggests, deep pits. And he has to avoid these threats by using all the things that he knows how to do, running, climbing, and swinging from vines. So as with any game, you have to play it numerous times to learn how to win. And as you go uh, along, you see that there's this underground tunnel. So if you look at the bottom of that uh, screenshot from the video game, and that allows you to move forward and save time. Sometimes that works great, but other times those shortcuts can lead you to a brick wall or some other threat, force you to turn around, and that, that can end up costing you valuable time. So today we'll discuss the pitfalls in perineal surgery, some worthwhile shortcuts, and hopefully some pearls that you can take home. So my objectives in the time provided are to discuss some key elements of pre-op planning to optimize both the surgeon and the patient experience. We're going to highlight some, you know, intraoperative uh, technical considerations so that we can help make your surgeries a little bit more efficient, um, go over some less encountered pitfalls and maneuvers and how to deal with them. So today I'm speaking specifically about male urethral surgery conducted through the perineum. I won't be speaking about perineal prostatectomy, uh, which is now done much less commonly than when I was in training. Uh, the first grouping of procedures that you see on this slide, and again, unfortunately, it's in gray, but, you know, they involve uh, surgery for male incontinence, namely the AUS and the male sling. Dr. Flynn also mentioned um, kind of a newer modality, the PROACT, which I won't go into. But first, you have to choose the right patients commensurate with your experience. So if you've done relatively few cases, take the chip shots early on and set yourself up for success. We want to reduce the risk of complications as much as possible, and this requires forethought. So relative to patient expectations, we want to under-promise and over-deliver. Technical poise is essential. Small, small mistakes can lead to inadvertent urethral disruption and an aborted case. In regard to urethral reconstruction, which is the lower grouping there, uh, for issues such as stricture, fistula, diverticulum, or even penile cancer, the devil's in the details. You want to learn to anticipate potential issues to prevent them and to effectively manage them should they arise. So in terms of setting expectations, you need to establish the level of pre-op suffering, right, and what a patient stands to lose. If they have severe incontinence, is significant improvement enough to be happy, even if they still have to use pads or liners? Is it worth having to cycle a device for each trip to the toilet? And we talked about success and how that varies. So remember that the rates of success depend on the definition that you use. A surgeon and much of the literature may see one pad per day as clinical success, whereas a patient may not. And Dr. Gonzalgo uh, touched on that in the first uh, lecture that he gave at this meeting. So always ask, is the worst case scenario worth the risk? Is there a plan B or a plan C if plan A fails? Some tertiary centers uh, may seem a little bit like a drive through window for surgery, whereby you go back to your referring urologist afterwards. But Others should recognize that patients treated for incontinence or stricture often become a long-term commitment. So an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Uh, surgeons generally don't like surprises, so you want to know as much as you can uh, about your patient. In my practice, we call it the SWEET approach, and so that stands for the same way each and every time. So you draw your line in the sand for what you feel is important. For me, and we talked about, a little bit, uh, we talked about this a little bit in the critique panel, if a patient didn't stop his aspirin, and shows up for perineal surgery, I'll reschedule every time. I also require a negative urine culture on file prior to any device placements. If you need clearance or if you suspect the patient is a less than perfect historian, bring all pertinent parties to the table, and that may include a primary care provider and or a cardiologist. And make sure the uh, patient has an idea of how the whole process goes from start to finish. So I lay this out in black and white prior to surgery with packets that I've created for each of the operations that I do, uh, because I think that you get the same questions. What's recovery like? You know, and you think about your FAQs and, you know, they're calling your office or they're asking your team. And it really simplifies things quite a bit. So Pitfall Harry, right, the character from the video game, would do well to remember the words of a, a different Harry, and that's Dirty Harry, when he said, a man's got to know his limitations. Thus, if the case seems very complex and you haven't done many of these, perhaps that's the one that you might refer out. I'm not really going to get into learning curve because we talked about how some of those numbers are arbitrary in the discussions that we had both about urethroplasty, about cancer surgery. But I do want to remind people that 
in redo surgery, the normal anatomic planes aren't there anymore, okay? So sharp dissection often serves you better than blunt dissection. You get into something sharply, it's a lot easier to put back together because it's happened in a reliable fashion. You start spreading in redo surgery and the planes just tear uh, in ways that you might not suspect, okay? With perineal urethrostomy, uh, which sometimes gets a bad rap, but is still a good operation for a number of people, you want to pay special attention to things like BMI because an abundance of perineal fat can make it very difficult to connect the urethra to the skin. Likewise, prior surgeries can lead to tissue fixation and compromised blood flow. I find that urethrostomies that are done after panectomies, and if they're done by urologists that are mainly cancer trained, and again, I'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus, but they tend to stenose more because they're using an end to skin technique rather than splitting the urethra ventrally and maintaining the corporal perforators dorsally. Um, Jesse had mentioned uh, Landon, I think, uh, Landon Trost in his uh, discussion on collagenase. And he uh, also wrote a paper where he referred to the cursed patient. Now it had to do with a, a different type of surgery, but it is something you wanna look for and that he, that terminology referred to someone that was compulsive obsessive, unrealistic, revision seeking, surgeon shopping, entitled, and in denial. Okay, you wanna make sure your operating room is optimized. This involves the room setup, staff education, and as I said before, the sweet technique allows for consistency, which is what you want. I've actually posted brief videos on YouTube for the operations that I perform, such that any new OR staff, and it seems like I'm always seeing new faces at my hospital, can watch these before my cases. So they learn the order of the steps, the instruments that I use, the equipment that's involved, and I found that to be very helpful. Also, make sure your preference cards are kept up to date. Take a moment to do your pregame with anesthesia. For example, if you're gonna take a buckle graft, tell them how you want the ET tube positioned. If you don't want them giving Toradol because it's an NSAID or so forth, let them know in advance. Pay attention to the patient prep. I've seen numerous physicians contaminate a field before the patient's been draped or fail to extend the initial prep to include all potential areas of interest. And you can understand if you're doing device cases, that becomes important. I'll speak briefly about antibiotic stewardship. I use a 10 minute mechanical scrub like a lot of people for devices prior to the chloroprep sticks, but just the sticks themselves if I'm doing other cases, unless I'm worried about the patient's perianal hygiene based on exam when you get them up in lithotomy for uh, perineal surgery. Prosthetic cases typically get IV vancomycin and genomycin beforehand, but be mindful that vancomycin is a slow infusion, so that should typically start in pre-op before the patient rolls back. Post-op, I still give three days of Bactrim to device patients since it does cover against MRSA. Uh, I used to give two weeks, and I know some people like my friend Melissa Kaufman at Vanderbilt has advocated for no post-op antibiotics, and I'm still trying to ease myself towards that. I don't keep urethroplasty patients on antibiotics, but I recognize that some high-volume surgeons, especially in Europe, will keep them on them for the entire interval until the catheter comes out. For device revisions um, and replacements, some advocate for antibiotic washouts, similar to the salvage protocols, but none of this is truly evidence-based. Um, it likely boils down to the principle of dilution, and I, I, I use field irrigation, and that typically involves saline, plus or minus any antibiotic additives. I used to uh, have them add bacitracin, but that's no longer available. Okay, so I'm sure you've heard this plenty of times in residency and maybe even afterwards, but exposure really is everything in surgery. When you're working in the perineum, it often takes two people to tango, right? You need an assistant, especially if you're teaching a resident or a fellow, but the working space can be quite tight. So you wanna free your hands from doing what a retractor can do, right? Never struggle. If you are, you're probably doing it wrong. One of the things that I do, if I have my fellow start a case and I'm looking over the shoulder and I'm trying to pull a John Madden and drawing pictures, if my hands get in there, almost always I'm extending the incision a little bit, putting the hooks a little bit deeper and because I, I just feel that they're making it look too difficult. That Yankauer suction tip is not always your friend. I see so many people overuse suction instead of just holding pressure until hemostasis can be achieved. Um, you know, and then they'll put it on a mucosal surface to the point of causing mucosal hemorrhage and edema. It's like a hickey, right, on the urethra. And that kind of edematous tissue doesn't hold suture well. So be judicious. Um, I'm a huge believer in illumination and magnification. One of my mentors was a pediatric urologist, and I think that might be where it com uh, comes from. I'm always using loops, I'm always using a headlight, but be mindful of that added weight and you know bending your neck. I recently acquired some angled loops from Designs for Vision that allow me to look downward despite my face looking uh, straight across. And I think Dr. Riley even mentioned a little bit about ergonomics being important in her uh, discussion on PCNL.
Okay, there are some special considerations when you're doing AUS surgery. If they've had a prior sling, this is typically gonna be fairly low in the perineum and possibly deep due to the prior tensioning. Focus on the accessible portion of the urethra distal to that, and don't waste time trying to cut out all the prior mesh. When going around the urethra, remember that that dorsal uh, plate or that dorsal part of the urethra is much less spongiosum protecting it, and inadvertent entry into the urethra should, should cause you to abort the case. You want to avoid too much blunt dissection, especially in those radiated patients, and it goes back to what I said about redo surgery, and radiation sometimes changes the planes the same way. And don't try to pass that right angle clamp too early around the urethra until you've adequately freed the urethra from the corpora on both sides. And remember that if you do get into the corpora, I always tell my, my residents, my fellows, and so forth, I said, if you get into the corpora, it's not the end of the world. I can fix that, right? The game's not over. However, if you get into the urethra, that changes things, you know? And so the patient might have to come back, and you might put them at a disadvantage. I think a big mistake that people make uh, when they're doing AUS surgery is how they measure the urethra and how they use that measurement to choose their cuff size. So you want to keep the measuring tape flush to the tissue and recognize that a four-centimeter cuff is four centimeters on the outside, meaning that the inside is tighter. So if you're between sizes, you wanna go with the larger one. Uh, the PRB, or the pressure regulating balloon, will allow filling to a point based on its pressure profile, pressure range, right? Not based on the cuff size. And again, this is my input that I'm giving you today so other people feel differently, but I would tell you never to use a three and a half centimeter cuff and never to place tandem cuffs. For redo cases, research has shown us that it isn't atrophy that makes the urethra look so narrow when the cuff is uncoupled. The capsule can be cut and the urethra can actually recover its fullness in real time right before your eyes, so you don't necessarily need to violate another segment. Now, that might seem controversial, and I bet in the critique panel discussion it might come up, um, and so we can go right at that point. But uh, we've demonstrated this, we've published this, we've shown videos of this, and if it was truly atrophied, it's hard to understand how it could go back to the exact same caliber right there in the operating room. If you have a hole somewhere in the system, if the system itself has been violated, I personally don't think you should waste your time using things like the ohm meter, trying to just replace a single component. At that point, it's a contaminated system. I think the best thing you could do is just swap out the whole thing because you can miss problems in other areas. Some of the post-prostatectomy patients, like the ones we talked about on the earlier days of this meeting, may want both their sexual function and incontinence fixed at the same time. If you're going to do a combo procedure, what we've sometimes called like a, an EMS 1500, right, because of the numbers of the devices, perform the sling or the sphincter part of it first. Um, I've seen some surgeons do both through the perineum, but I personally feel that that's a fool's errand. Again, that's just my opinion. I feel similarly about penis-scrotal AUS placement, but that you know, could be the subject for a different lecture entirely. Um, there are some implications that you should know about when you do both at the same time. Patient might have a slightly more difficult recovery, um, essentially with two pumps in the scrotum now instead of one. Surgeon reimbursement is reduced in most cases for the lesser RVU case that you're doing. And if it's a Medicare patient, the hospital's only gonna get paid for one of those two devices. And so that becomes especially important when you're thinking about thousands of dollars um, for each one. All right, specific to urethroplasty, I've learned that several items can allow for more efficient use of your time. In most cases, you should have an idea of whether you're going to do an anastomotic repair or what we call a substitution repair when you're placing a graft in advance. In the x-ray picture of that retrograde urethrogram, I'd definitely be planting a graft so I could harvest one before I ever made an incision down below, unless I had enough help to do it both simultaneously. So when I worked with Dr. Flynn in the back, he and I could, would sometimes do this uh, concurrent while one of us was you know, taking a graft, the other one was getting the exposure. I like to scope before I make incision and during the case if needed. If you have suprapubic access, patient comes in with an SP tube, you can come from above and below to gauge the length of the stricture uh, much more effectively. Knowing the location avoids making a suboptimal uh, incision site and uh, certainly avoids some unnecessary dissection. Don't struggle for exposure. Tack the scrotum up with silk sutures if you need to. You can put the urethra on stretch for stability using a 3-0 proline gland stay suture. A self-retaining retractor is essential. I, I actually prefer the disposable Lone Star over the metallic Jordan retractor or perineal book walter. Um, angled debakey clamps can really uh, do a nice job helping to provide some urethral compression for hemostasis without necessarily compressing it so tightly that you're worried about causing another stricture. And that's in Beckman. Uh, for some reason, this, this instrument isn't uh, 
you know, commonly used, but it's essentially a Wheatlander uh, with an adjustable arm so you can get additional deeper traction. There are some key principles for urethral reconstruction. First, you have to see it to treat it, like any other disease. If a patient's been doing CIC, which we just heard a lot about CIC, has an indwelling catheter, has had a recent manipulation, dilation, DVA, and so forth, they should be put on at least six weeks of urethral rest. If needed, they can have a temporary suprapubic tube. The obliterated segment that you see in that picture right there is six weeks after removing a 16 French urethral foley. And so, as you can imagine, when the 16 French came out, it was at least 16 French, and then now it's entirely obliterated. The adjacent picture is what it looked like after surgery on his VCUG. Um, next, be mindful of uh, you know, excess tension or crush injury to delicate tissue. Use stay sutures liberally if needed. I use a lot of 4 Vicro. Urethral surgery travels well, so if we do work in other countries, you know, it's kind of a you know, a wake-up call to what you really need or don't need here. Um, you don't need a lot of fancy equipment. Most of my operations done with a pair of Metzenbaum scissors and Colorado tip cautery. Um, you want to mobilize, and I always say go blue, part, you know, because I'm a Michigan fan, but what that reference really has to do is with dividing the investing layers of the urethra down to the tunic of the urethra where it almost takes on a bluish hue. It's typically said that, you know, you should avoid mobilizing the urethra beyond the penoscrotal junction because of fear of causing cordy, but mobilization isn't the issue. It's trying to approximate ends that are just too far apart. So tension's the enemy, and your lumen should be calibrated to confirm adequate caliber. You want a watertight anastomosis, and that might require a one or two layer closure. Dorsal grafts, uh, I think George Webster used to say, are, they're spread fixed, right? You can secure them dorsally, and they can be quilted to the corpora. You can actually check the integrity of your closure with pericatheter irrigation using a lubricated angiocatheter on a small syringe next to the foley and just uh, inject saline. It doesn't necessarily have to have dye. All right, so Paul Maroney is a good friend of mine. He's a great urologist I met when I was a fellow at UC Denver. He once mentioned a, a mental maneuver to me that he uses in surgery and I've never forgotten it. He said that if he ever has a case that seems difficult or if it's lacking forward progress, he'll pause and ask, if this is going perfectly, what would it look like? And I think that kind of mindfulness is worthwhile in all surgery. Okay, in the perineum, use a urethral catheter, a wire, or a sound to reaffirm the midline. If you go too quickly without anything like that, you can easily get too deep on one side of center. Blunt dissection is often helpful in virgin cases, but if, as I've already said probably twice now, you want to limit that and redo surgery. And, you know, work for, from known to unknown, right? We talk about that in a lot of different types of operations that we do. And in some cases, it may be easier to identify the urethra more distally in the perineum as it gets closer to the lower scrotum and then follow it back proximally. All right, so when leaving UPenn, Sir William Osler advocated for equanimity. So what that is, is it refers to the ability to coolly assess the situation, determine the best course of action, and then, you know, and correction, and then to move forward. So at times, that may require some humility, and may require some moral courage to ask for additional skilled assistance. The great surgeon will feel no loss of face when asking a colleague for help. So we have to be prepared to adapt when the unexpected happens. Perhaps a suprapubic access was lost during your case. The retrograde urethrogram may have underestimated the length of the stricture, or maybe there was another proximal stricture you weren't aware of. Remember to breathe. You can't panic, you can't blame those assisting you, and you can't scream and at your staff and start throwing instruments on the floor. Like, I mean, I guess you could do all those things, but that, that behavior is not gonna make you very popular and it's moving you away from excellence. Um, know when to read the writing on the wall and recognize when it's time to close and to fight another day. It doesn't happen very often, but it can happen. Okay. I come from an Irish Catholic family and I have a fondness for many four-letter words, uh, but one that seems often too dirty to speak for surgeon, uh, surgeons is the word help. And this shouldn't be the case. If you need input, call someone. It doesn't matter if it's in the planning stages and you're, you know, when the patient's in the clinic or if you're in the OR. Mentorship, I, I think, is extremely valuable. Um, and you know, if you want to think about biblical proverbs, they teach us as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens the other. So, Reaching out to someone else also helps build important relationships like the ones being built at this meeting, and it's a sign of intelligence rather than weakness. If you're incorporating some of these surgeries into your practice, don't go it alone the first few times. Proctoring and preceptoring programs are available at no cost uh, for device cases. Beware of what I call the chasers or patients that have seen multiple providers due to unreasonable and consequently unmet expectations. And despite our desire to use our skills and to help pet patients, maintain a sense of when better is the enemy of good, and experience certainly helps in this regard. If patients persist, encourage them to get an outside opinion rather than allowing yourself to be pressured into doing an operation that you aren't fully confident is warranted. 
So these are my final thoughts for you. Success in surgery begins before the patient even signs the consent form. So make sure that both you and the patient know what you're getting yourselves into. Start simple, adhere to a system, don't compromise on essentials, cut your teeth on straightforward cases, and never be afraid to ask for help from a trusted friend with more experience. And lastly, I learned this when I was in uh, Colombia, and that's coge la suave, and what it means is to take it smooth or to take it easy. Elective surgery should be an enjoyable experience. Be mindful to keep it that way and make adjustments as necessary.